Oh boy. All right, I think we're good. I mean, oh, are, are Celtics fans going to stay up for this one? Or did they put a movie on by this? Uh, are they they got Netflix on going right now? For the Celtics fans that are still out there, I mean, we still have a show tonight. Did you just say we're good? We're the opposite yeah. of good. We are the opposite of good. This is bad. This is very, <laughs> very bad. I guess I meant we're live, right? We're live. It's the Celtics post game show. It's CLNS Media. The Celtics play so bad that uh, I think John quit. No. <laughs> no <laughs> Yeah, right. Gonna be here, right? Dude. But you know, it's the three man, three man crew, three man show. Joseph Pavone, Jimmy Toscano, Bobby Manning. Jimmy, I'll let you come in hot. What you got here? You're already coming in hot. Go ahead. I'm gonna say first of all, nobody's more upset that he couldn't be here tonight than John. This is like John's Super Bowl. You know what I mean? Like this, 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 this performance, this game. This is where John would would be grinning from ear to ear, coming out flying and just ripping the team from top to bottom as they should be i mean when you consider the fact that you know danny ainge is going you know all over the place you know defending the, defending brad and you know all this about the team and then wick goes on the radio today and you know takes a couple bullets and you know d- defends the team and defends the coach and pretty much defends everybody and then the team Goes out there and says, "Hey, thanks, Wick. We're just gonna go ahead and like sleepwalk up and down the court here. We're, we're not gonna, gonna play defense. The same thing. We're just gonna keep doing the same. It's fine. <laughs> That's we're even worse. Let, we're gonna let the we're gonna let Daniel Gallinari, excuse me, go off for a hundred points and just automatic. The guy's taking forty-four three pointers. Um, you know, respect to Gallinari, man. This guy's been in the league for a long time, just kind of cruising along. I feel like he's always got a wild contract and he's just always under." like pretty much like underperforms for the most part, but sure enough, leave it to the Celtics to let this guy completely go off as they just do now, no matter who the team is, somebody's going off on them. And it was Gallinari tonight. Yeah. It's open season on these guys, right, Bobby? Yeah. And that that's about the last guy we talked about uh, Jalen Brunson last game being the random figure who dropped a big game against the Celtics. And he wasn't a 30 plus point scorer tonight. They've had eight of those in a row against them. Uh, but for Gallinari to be that guy, and not just a minor one, like, oh, he went off tonight. You know, he did, he did way more than he usually does. For him to be the featured presence, you know, 8-8 eight eight out of the gate, 38 on the game, that had to be about as many threes as any single player has had against the Celtics in NBA history. Never mind the Hawks yeah, doing it as a team tonight. Yeah, that's uh, right. So the Hawks did, uh, the, the Celtics once again on the wrong end of history, right, guys? You know, <laughs> the other end. <laughs> Uh, what, what is it? Was it twenty-three three-pointers? Uh, the the Atlanta Hawks. It's the first time any Celtics team in the history of the Boston Celtics that a team has allowed that many three-pointers. So yeah, twenty-three to eight. Yeah. Celtics. This team again in the history books for the wrong reasons. Yeah. See, this is what I want. I, the, good, good, good call here, Bobby. Bobby is uh, c- controlling the comments to, tonight. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna let you guys run the show here for for a good portion of it, right? A lot of comments here. We're gonna get you guys through this. All right. This is gonna be therapeutic for everyone. All right. Yeah, keep, just keep pretend, it clean. pretend you're on your uh, therapist couch with your feet up. All right, we, you were here yeah. to bed. All right, <laughs> let it all out. Get get it all out before you go to bed. You can't go to bed, you know, angry, right? Get it all well, out. If, if Bobby's your therapist, I mean, he's actually probably a good therapist. He's gonna tell you that everything's gonna be fine. It's gonna be okay. I know, right? They're gonna, gonna, they're gonna go me. make. Yeah. They're gonna exactly. go make a gigantic trade and you know fix everything <laughs> and they're you know all this stuff wrong. This team and I said this yesterday. <laughs> um, I said this yesterday. You, you, you're probably not good enough to even make a trade and contend. It's not worth blowing anything up at this point or throwing all your assets at one player or whatever you want to call it to try to catch a team like the Nets or the Sixers who are clearly better than you. And it doesn't, it doesn't end there. There are other teams right now, many of them, that are clearly better than you. I'm not even sure where they are in this. Are they officially out of the playoffs? picture at this moment or is it i know they're, they're down the, the line. they're down the seven with the next so they're tied for seventh with yeah, the next. they're like one loss away from like being on the outside looking at not that the playoffs are starting tomorrow but it just goes I mean, to they, show you where they are i mean they're not contenders their owners their own, own owner said it today or governor said it today uh you know we're not a contending team when you're a game below 500 you can't consider yourself contenders and honestly that's the one thing they supported that he said tonight they definitely proved his point there they are not contenders because the effort is what really got me tonight. I mean, you just can't give up 23 three-pointers. That's just like, where is the on-ball defense? Like, where is, like, the rotations? Like, guys, come on. Like, come on. 
Yeah, yeah and you I, know I, what? I you know what? Speaking of effort, sorry, but I have to cut you off. But I just want to like let's let's go to let's transition to and, and focus in on on uh, on Jason Tatum because. I mean, for someone like Jason Tatum, after everything that was said, after the performance we saw last night, did you see anything different? Like, did you even see an attempt to to switch his approach or or did because I don't know. Am I the only one in thinking that Jason Tatum gave me the message that, listen, I it's not me. You know, I don't need to change anything about my approach. That's the message I got from Tatum because nothing changed. Nothing. I, I saw any, I didn't see anything different. Did you, Bobby? No, and the defense is what continues to irk us. We've been talking about the defense since opening night, I feel like. And that was a decent one, but then they went right out in that Nets game on number two and got absolutely obliterated on that end of the floor. And it hasn't gotten much better since. I keep looking at their numbers and seeing their top ten and this and that, and I'm like, you know, this you don't see that out there. So the whole league must be doing dreadful on defense if this defense is top ten because they don't have it on that end. The way Brown gets burst by, I thought Tatum had a few decent quarters at the beginning of the week on Sunday and Tuesday on that end of the floor, but then it dipped late. And, uh, you know, I looked at the defensive numbers, especially in the second half for this team. They're like 26th in the third quarter and 28th in the fourth quarter in terms of defensive rating. So they just fall off the map in the second quarter. I think Wick said something, and we'll get to Wick's comments earlier about exhaustion and just mental fatigue and all these kind of things. And that's what you do see with this team. They look worn out. They look defeated. Like, no hope is left. And what what describes that better than this game today? You know, it's, yeah. just, a, it's just a way to salvage a road trip that hasn't gone well at all. You know, make, it, make sure it's not a complete disaster. And then get home for four straight before the All-Star break and maybe end up above 500 again and, and kind of reestablish yourself going forward. Now this thing is on the edge of sputtering out of control. I mean, this is seven straight losses against teams that are below 500. And that includes two of the worst teams in the league, the Hawks twice. And the Hawks are – if you watched the Hawks last night and then saw them tonight and the way they lost to the Cavs and then laid the beat down here, I mean, that just really shows you where the Celtics are in the league right now. It's about as bad as anyone. They might be the – the Rockets were the most embarrassing team for a little while there with the whole Harden debacle and then how bad it was after that. I think the Celtics have kind of taken the torch in the last two weeks. I think what's most frustrating about these losses is obviously the pattern of inconsistent inconsistency on defense. But in particular, what, what pisses me off with the Celtics continue to do is when they, they, they're they down big, right? It happens in a hurry, right? They're down by 12, they're down by 15, they're down by 17. And then they just regress to what got them there in the first place, right? Poor ball movement, you know, uh, jacking up shots, six, seven seconds to the shot clock, you know, just, you know, uh, their approach is, is as, almost as if there is only two minutes left in the game, whereas it's still the first or second quarter. Like, I saw the exact same thing that we saw last night that we saw – the game before that, where they come out looking great, the ball's moving. Scott Brady mentions it. You know, it's the same thing all over again. Oh man, they're really, you know, everyone's. You could tell the point of emphasis is, you know, they're really spraying the ball tonight. This is this is gonna be a different game, Mike. Let me tell you. And then five minutes later, <laughs> they're right back into their old patterns because it's a twelve point deficit and they're freaking out. You know, it's like the world's going to end in that first quarter. And it's, they continue to do it over and over again. So is this a confidence thing? Because at this point, I mean, obviously their confidence is, is really low, but is it to the point where it's like through the stretch of the game, they're just not mentally tough enough to withstand those Correct. droughts? Or is it just these guys just need a break and they're already looking at the all-star break and thinking, man, can it come next week? Because we're, we're, we're done. We need a break. I think you nailed a lot of those things. I mean, when I look at this, this specific Celtics team, I can't think of one – like solid, really good attribute that stands out about them. Like, like you said, they lack confidence. They lack an identity. They sure as hell luck, lack toughness. I mean, we saw a little bit of life late in that fourth quarter against the Mavericks. Came up short. Luca hit those two nasty threes. Other than that, though, I have seen little, uh, you know, fight like that recently. We obviously saw none of that tonight. This was a scheduled loss for them. I mean, they came into this game thinking <laughs> L, and it was just an L. And you know what? At There's this no point, sch- Jimmy, the schedule is a scheduled loss. Like, the whole thing. Exactly. The whole schedule. Like, well, Bobby, Bobby, how about, how about Brad before this one, right? When they're talking about the new schedule, he's just like, he said, what, what do you – I don't know who asked him, but he's like, what do you think about the, you know, the, 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 the second half of the schedule came yeah. out? He's just like, hey, we play every other day. Like, it, whoever yeah. we play against, it doesn't even matter, okay? We're just, it doesn't matter. It's an L. Win, it doesn't okay? matter anymore. It's I got Trey Young to deal with again. Like, don't I don't care about who we're playing in two weeks. Like, I need to win. This team needs to win now. And 
we can't stop Trey. We can't stop, you know, Zion, you, you name it. You know, the, the, any of the opposing team's best player had a field day against us. And that's I'm the thing about Brad. Like, <laughs> we're going to talk about him quite a bit later, and he's done the talk of the show for two weeks now. And there's always that thing of, oh, I would do this if I was him. I would do that. I mean, he has done everything at this point. Bench the starters in the fourth tonight. Maybe he could have done that a little earlier. I probably would have done it yeah. for the whole second half the way this one had gone. I, I yeah, same. Agree. Um, Tatum still ended up with over 30 minutes in a that's the doc. That's the doc thing to do, right? We talked about that last night about how you, how you should punish the starters. That, that's what a doc would have done. You know, the second in half. a game like this, it was probably warranted. Yeah. So punish your starters. Like this, that's yeah. rewarding them. That's rewarding them. At the, in a game like this, you take them out at halftime. That's rewarding the starters. They should be embarrassed. They should have to play through a 30-point 30, uh, 30 loss like this because they're the reason behind it. At the end of the day, they come out there and put a half ass effort out there just so they can sit their ass on the bench in the second half and, and have their eyes on um, you know the All-Star game. Listen, there are important games here throughout the season. I know that we're very far away from the playoffs, I'm not saying that Celtics will be anywhere near it, but this is where you build – who you are. This is where you build good habits and you, you know, you work off what you, what the limited practices you have, you work up off, off those. Didn't this team just practice prior to the Mavericks game? Weren't yeah. they? Didn't they? Yeah. So a lot of freaking good that did, right? I mean, geez, <laughs> whatever they worked on, work on it harder because damn thing that they could have taken from practice tonight uh, in Atlanta and Atlanta's coming off a game too. Atlanta's coming off a tough loss. They lost at the buzzer. So don't give me any of this, you know, oh, they're tired. I mean, everyone's playing a similar amount of schedule, similar schedules here. All the games are packed together. Everyone's traveling all over the place. These guys are young. I mean, that should be less of an excuse to be tired, right? These are, this is supposed to be young legs. You have, like, three old guys on this entire team. So, so Josue, I, I want to throw this at you, too. Like, where did this go wrong? I remember a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the Lakers game and we were freaking out about Smart's injury, but we weren't really all that bummed about that loss. Like they had been competing to that point. They were kind of stuck a little bit above 500, but you thought they might figure it out. Then it just went somewhere along the last two or three weeks to complete dumpster fire mode. And it is like game after game, it just keeps getting closer and closer to a disaster here. But it really wasn't all that bad, and I keep mentioning the eight and three start, and then it slipped a little bit from there, and then it just kept sliding even more. Like, what was the impetus of this? I guess it goes back to that smart injury because that was kind of the turning point. Yeah, I think that was the turning point. But believe it or not, I feel like it was after that uh, terrific offensive showing, right? The twenty three pointers at home against the Toronto Raptors. You know, the Toronto Raptors came out strong. The Celtics just you saw the consistency for forty eight minutes, and it wasn't just on defense, but we saw it. We saw probably their best game on both ends, right? You know, for them to put it all together like that, maybe they, it was fool's gold for them. Maybe they thought that that was a turning point and they could just ease into it because I think the, the next game was the matinee against the Knicks and they they, they they mopped the floor with the Celtics, right? Remember that? Yeah. And uh, Kemba, you know, was trying to ease back. Smart goes down. So I guess it was a combination of the things that a lot of teams in the NBA are dealing with, you know, to be completely, to be honest with you. I mean, yeah, to a certain extent, Kemba Walker is, is different uh, compared to other teams, but whether we're talking about schedules, whether we're talking about uh, players not being able to, you know, not, not active because of uh, COVID protocols. I mean, these are all the same curveballs that all the other teams have dealt with. And sure, there are other teams like the Miami Heat and, you know, other teams that are, you know, that they're not destined to fail uh, based on their record, but it's a little different with the Celtics because the way they're going about this, like they're losing against teams that they shouldn't be losing against, or at least they shouldn't be doing it throughout this stretch, right? This was supposed to be the quote-unquote easy stretch, right? It was supposed to be the chance for the Celtics to catch up on wins before the All-Star break and, and and see where they stand, and all of a sudden they're like way outside of top five, and we don't even know where they're going to land. Top you five? Know? Top five? That would be... That would be great for them right now, right? <laughs> they need a two like game. Bottom five. They need a two game winning streak to get into top five again, right? <laughs> Man, when's the next I, time? When's the last time we saw a two gamer, right, from this, from this team? Listen, this, this, this uh, not the January. Yeah, January, like right? January. Almost, almost last year, almost probably mid or something like that. Right. I mean, again, uh, to me, it, I, I always look for. You know, what's the attitude look like on the team? What are the players, how are the players acting, their, their mannerisms, their body language out there? And I just see a bunch of flat players with no life in them. I don't know if it's just 
the grind of the season or or what. Um, but again, I said this yesterday. Fans and media and everyone else can say, you know, fire Brad, fire Brad. That's not going to have any effect really on what Wick or Danny Ainge decide to do with Brad. The only player going to players have have that effect starts with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. If they put performances together like they did leading the team today, then yeah, Brad Brad's going to end up being gone. They're they're not there's not going to be any choice because there's a disconnect there. There's a tuning out. I'm saying if it continues down this trend. They're, they're the only people that can save Brad's job at the end of the day. If they have his back, great. If they don't, all right, then, then we know where they're at with him. So that's how it always happens with these with these firings. It's not like, oh, fire Brad because they're losing a bunch of games. It's, it's is he capable of raising this team to the level that it needs to be at? Or are these players basically, have they reached a point where they're not really listening? They're not grasping. They're not interested in what he has to say or or what the coaching staff as a whole really has to say because at some point that does happen so it's not well, really is this team tuning brad out was 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 gary washburn on or something was he you know was he ahead of this thing what, what do you think i mean really, like honestly because you know not just in, in you know when we're talking about the the stars right because that's what everyone's we, we were talked about it a lot last night you know the, the stars are the ones that are going to call or, or decide Brad Stevens' fate, right? But as the team as a whole, do, do you think it's easier for other guys to sort of, do you think it's start getting to a point where they're tuning him out because they're not quite sure they're in the rotation anymore? Or are they saying, oh, this is this is all Jason and Jalen's team. So, you know, I'm not even really into, you know, just the, let me know when I got to go in and, 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 and play my 10 to 12 minutes, you know, Brad, and, and, and I'm going to check out. Like, is there, a, is there a chance that, that that's happening here? Well, I always think there's going to be a sense that players, role players particularly, know their hierarchy on the team. Like, I don't think sure. the Grant Williams and Semi Ojeleys of the world are that concerned that Tatum and Brown are trying to do all of this or pressing too hard or anything like that. I mean, they've been they're Tatum to be and in Brown. The league right now. Yeah. Tatum and Brown, this has been Tatum and Brown's team for a little bit. They better do everything. Now. They better do everything. They better be taking the balls out to the bus. Yeah, but I, I said last night. Start to take a longer look at Tatum here. He's avoided the criticism for much of this year. There's been heat on Brad. There's been heat on Ainge. But at some point, your top players have to come through and take games like this one in particular just by being all-stars and being all-NBA guys in this league. Their efforts alone should be able to get by in these games. I think John said something to that effect that like a, a sign of a good team is winning when you're playing like crap. And mm-hmm. usually... We've seen the Celtics in recent years underperform in games like this and still be able to find ways to scratch it out, take a win, even if it's a narrow one, even if it's harder than it needs to be. But to now go into these games that should be easily winnable. I mean, we've talked about soft spots in the schedule or places where they can pick up wins. None of that feels like it now. Like, I had the Celtics winning this one, but I really was like, do they, do I des- do they deserve for me to pick them against anyone at this point? Like, whether it's the Wizards or the Hawks or whoever. Like, the there's way they're playing within there's themselves. Definitely a, there's definitely a pissed off uh, a Celtics fan who's who's losing a lot of money out there. Some the generous. <laughs> yeah. <fans. laughs> it's like so, game, after, game after game. You're like, oh, they can't lose another one, can they? And that's the feeling I had here going into this one. Like, the Hawks right. were very banged up here. They were missing another starter in, um, in Cam Reddish on top of what they were already missing last week. Devastating loss on yesterday. They're on a back-to-back. I know the Celtics have lost four straight now without Kemba, but like maybe a little more from Pritchard or this Teague start yeah. again, the forcocted Teague start that we have to go through. It, it's just I don't hate that. I don't hate that because you want to talk about fresh legs and a guy that you know yeah. coming off the second half yeah. back-to-back. And Teague, honestly, I know people in the chat don't want to probably talk about it. He wasn't he's awful. He wasn't awful. First or second you know, reliable guy tonight. I thought Neesmith yeah. was another guy who, who played well in, in stretches and he actually shot well. So maybe he should consider shooting more often. I don't know. Tristan. That's probably like what his job is out there. Can we give Tristan a little bit of credit? I know he's limited, but look at the way he's fighting out there. 13 and 13 all over the boards. I mean, something's yeah. missing there, but he is giving it everything he has at this point. He's turned it up to another level. Yeah, I see Don't the say he's turned it up to another level. What level? Thirteen like, and thirteen, like, like level five. Like what level <laughs> has he turned it up? To? Jimmy and John, you're gonna need extra because you're gonna have to channel John here on Thompson. But 
<laughs> yeah. Are you right. guys are you guys waiting for twenty and twenty from him? Like, what's it gonna be? Thirty and thirty? Thirteen and thirteen is a fantastic know. game. While we're talking about the bigs, can we can we throw uh, an enormous amount of shade for Grant Williams for that Trey for that Trey oh. Young? Oh. Can we have that? I wish we had that. We could just throw it up here. I mean, I'll, is that I'll not talk so bad enough second year in the NBA? Jeez, dude, that that like sums up like the whole experience. I feel like this season. It with, really does with him. It's like a microcosm of the season. I, I, I mean, love his reaction to it too. Like you know, he's looking at Grant. You know, <laughs> Trey's just like that had to man. You just it was too easy. Like, you just like, you Grant seems like you know he's a smart guy, right? I mean, how many? times have we all seen the highlight reel or the mixtape where somebody just does exactly that like yeah. you just can't completely turn your back to the inbounder like yeah. in what league in what league has anyone ever gotten away with that i mean rec league when you're in fifth grade kids will do that to you <laughs> like how do you do that it's not like come on grant like yeah. and you know help, you know help us help you man we don't want to have to talk about a rondo team. that's a rondo team that's, he, yeah, he rondo looked, probably was like yo rondo probably put that in the playbook before the game oh rondo has like rondo school for all the guards they have to sit <laughs> yeah. rondo for it for uh, about Trey Young is lear learning a Every lot practice. i'm sure this season oh yeah Trey young has his notebook going like are you kidding me that, yeah. that's, the, that's the relationship that i think you know out of everyone trey's gonna benefit the most out of that whether it's one year or two years however long oh. he's there he's gonna milk that for what it's worth because he's already got the shot he's gonna need rondo thankfully exactly. for the shot he just needs, he just needs rondo for the smarts exactly he needs the smarts the tricks you know the ins and outs you know you know that keeping rondo it, stuff keeping it with the bigs bobby wants to come in thompson fine i'll let you i'll let you get your thompson talking because john's not here and you'll never get it in otherwise <laughs> so that's fine but our guy rob another game another 14 minutes oh here we go it just it, honestly, I'm not, one. I'm not even mad. I can't even get mad about it anymore because I'm going to get sick. My doctor said you just can't keep getting mad about the same thing over and over again. So I'm going to take his advice because it just is what it is at this point, I guess. I mean, I don't know what it would take. If you want to talk about, Jimmy, what's it going to take for you and John to be happy with, with, Tom, with Thompson? What's it going to take? Where am I? Oh, okay. Doing a little... <laughs> Doing a little something. I was about to just, okay. I my wife Let's out. watch this. There it is. Okay. <laughs> we're we're, we're some, doing the uh, – what's the thing we're adding Kenny some Smith little Did we get here. that? Yeah. The little uh, – the, 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 what do we call that, Joe Sway? Boom. Off the I mean, back like, what on the inbounds? I don't even yeah, know, man. I guess. I mean, literally, that's down. what it's called. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Play it one more time. It doesn't happen enough for there to be a name. Play one Let's run it back. We call, it the so G -dub. we call it the G dub now. We call it the I didn't G -dub. realize how bad it was until the replay. It happened so fast. Oh my god! I mean, what are you looking at, buddy? Like, like by the time he knew what, by the time he realized what happened, Trey was running back like, the other way. He's like you're you're not even covering anybody. You're just standing <laughs> out in the, in the abyss. Why is why is this back to the inbounder? No, he tapped, you know, he turned as if someone tapped his shoulder. He's just like, oh, "What's up, man?" <laughs> like he just turned around, like, "What's up?" I mean, no one's no one's even looking at Young. How do you know where the ball is going or what's going on? But if you're not looking at the inbounder, that's the job like, of covering the inbounder. Literally, every, not one player, not one player right now is looking at the inbounder on the Celtics. I mean, nope. Oh. Okay, oh, good. this, this is defense more, is this is more shade than I than right. I thought. We seen enough. That was great. A lot of shit. All right. This defense say, anyway. is another level of embarrassing. How are they seventh in the league? I mean, what are the other teams doing? <laughs> because I don't know. every once in a while, we should do that. We should do like our own little like like Shackton almost. <laughs> oh know, man! All right. Seventh well, in the league, they're not. Don't let the numbers fool you. You just trust your eyes. That's all you gotta do. Sometimes people in these numbers, they get too caught up in them. Just, just, just. You see it. You see the issues out there, right? No. So that's why I see Rob Williams making an impact when he's out there. And I say, why is he only getting like 12, 14 minutes a game? What's it going to take? Never mind. what's it going to take for me to be impressed with Thompson? What's it going to take for Brad to give Rob more minutes? What's it going to take? All right. What's so I don't want to do this whole thing again because we did it yesterday. On a minute restriction, Jimmy, right? He's on a minute restriction. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to do it either. I don't want to do it. I just want to bring up the fact that it's just another yeah. game, another 14 minutes, and we'll move on from it. You could have yeah, I mean. Don't say when you, you lose by 20 or 25 I'm not, or unless, unless the conspiracy is continuing, Jimmy, and he, he's now matching the number game after game so he can cover up from his past mistakes of not playing Rob. 
<laughs> I mean, come on. He's so he's obviously on a minutes restriction. He's go- I respect he's going down with this one. He's going to make sure. He would have gone full run in that fourth quarter if he was able to go. Like, Let's keep and I, I had talked to someone who said there were a few moments like where he looked like he was laboring on uh, in yesterday's game in particular. I didn't get to go back and look for those, but see, um, see now it's in people's heads now. He, you know, Brad planted that. <laughs> this is Brad's final conspiracy on his way out. Yeah. Oh man, kidding. Um, anyway. what else you got anything off? Right, anything? I was gonna say anything more off this game because that's kind of it for me. No. Yeah, that's exactly what. See, we're on the same. We're on the same page here. Yeah, let's, let's I mean, I'll just, let's keep just, it. Let's, just let's keep disappointing. It. I mean, we talk about rock bottom. Is it? Is this the new rock? Are we just going to keep going lower and lower? Is this the new one now? And like until the next game, or or what? Like, I, I'm not even sure, Jimmy. But I get the feeling that the, I don't see like a winning streak coming on here, right? Maybe they win one, they lose two, but some sort of thing like that until the All Star break. But either way, bigger picture. Let's talk about what happened this morning because. While I was uh, sipping my first coffee of coffee of the day, Mike Gorman was ripping this team a new one, man. Mike Gorman was swearing, <laughs> he was acting like he did it, like 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 he was on a boomer podcast. rage. No, we got boomer rage. No, no the real one. With these damn he boomers. Swore, he dropped the BS, and then he said it again. Like yeah, because this is bullshit. like I was like okay, th- th- he's mad. He's mad, mad. Like that's he, he, that's he angry. Mike. And and yeah, he's he's big mad. And it wasn't just about the Celtics. It was about the two All Stars. What did you guys make of that? Calling, calling them out, saying that pretty much they care more about their stats than they care about uh, making the team better or making their teammates better, rather. What do you think, Bobo? It was fair. Uh, again, I have said through all of this, everybody's warranted a criticism mm-hmm. here. Now, I don't think any of these players and actors that we've criticized and uh, blasted at certain times should be thrown out the door, fired, uh, traded, these kind of things. But... I, in particular, have I Tatum him the last few games, and it feels mm-hmm. like he is losing trust in the system, um, in their ability to win these games. I mean, 32 minutes tonight, one assist, that's the kind of thing we're talking about, and that's what Gorman was talking about in particular, the assist numbers, the assist rate of this team, the ball movement, the percentage of makes that are coming off assists. I think it was about 40 to like 19 tonight in the end, maybe a couple more because the bench hit a bunch of shots down the stretch. And that honestly probably pumped up their assist numbers as a team, the way that bench played the final 15, uh, 12 minutes. So I don't see the ball movement out of those two. It feels like they're stopping the ball more than ever. I give Brown credit because it's at least downhill action, transition. Again, early in this game, I thought his aggression was needed offensively. But defensively, I don't see what I need to from Brown. And that's half the battle that we're talking about right now. So those two in particular definitely have not set a good standard for this team. But I also think the weight that's been put on them has been particularly unfair with this condensed schedule, with some of the ailments that Brown's gone through. I know Wick mentioned the COVID situation with Tatum that he's had to go through at this point. So I don't look at these guys like some of the harshest critics have said and said they're selfish, they're in it for themselves, uh, they're blowing off this team at this point, because that's not who they've been in the past. I think they're both just going through the first crisis of their careers frankly, when we look back on it. I mean, 2019 was bad, but there were never any crisis moments until the playoff ending there. Um, and then on top of that, the fatigue, uh, the ailments, the physical wear and tear of the amount of stuff they're being asked to do. So I think there's a larger context to why they're playing the way they are right now. I don't think they've said, screw this, we quit. Um, but it's not good. The results are all the same in the end. Yeah, I I, I appreciated what, what Gorman said. I thought there was a lot of truth to it. Um, from him. The voice was powerful. From him. Coming from from, from yeah. him of all people. I mean, geez, right. you, you know. But And he's seen a lot of Celtics basketball. He's seen a lot of good teams and a lot of bad teams. And I think he has a good finger on on the pulse of, you know, the sort of bones of a team. You know, he doesn't just come out and shoot from the hip. You know, I think he forms a lot of you know, educated opinions and he probably talks to people and just has a good idea of, you know, where this team is at. And a lot of the stuff he said was true. I mean, yeah, one-on-one, these guys are two of the more talented players. Statistically speaking, you can make the, they're, you know, all-stars. I, listen, we talked about a few, a few games ago, we saw a situation where both of them weren't going to make the team, which, you know, of course they, they did. Uh, but a guy like Trey Young was snubbed, right? I mean, a guy like Sabonis, who they're going to see Friday, was snubbed. They made the All-Star All Star team, 
but they're going up against players who are actually playing like all-stars and playing like they want to win, not playing just to fill up the stat sheet. And by the way, these guys aren't really necessarily filling up the stat sheet. I mean, they're trying, but the way that they're <laughs> playing right, the way yeah. that they're playing right now is horrible. But on the other end, it kind of goes back to okay, well, who are they playing with out there? When you see Tatum taking twenty shots or Brown taking twenty shots, it's like who else do you want to take in those shots when Kemba sits and Smart's out? There's not a whole lot of other options. Yeah, we want Neesmith to take more than zero shots like he did against Dallas. But in terms of go-to guys, I think these these guys like Tatum and Brown are thinking, well, you know, I'm not necessarily super confident that, you know, player Y over here to my left is going to be in the right position or is going to make the right decision or hit the shot. So I'm going to go ahead and trust myself to, to do it for right or wrong. Um, it's not good team basketball, as Mike said, um, which I totally agree with. And it's why they're losing because it is a superstar league, but you're only going to go as far as, you know, the depth guys are going to get you. If it's just two on five out there, it's a numbers game. You know, you, obviously you're not going to, you're not talented enough to compete with like that. So, right. It's interesting. Though. All right. Maybe it's a little too early for this, but it's already there for me. Uh, either one of you starting to think that maybe these two are just having a tough time playing with each other. Well, the same court. Like, I don't know. I think when Kemba's not there, it makes things difficult in the sense that they don't have someone to sort of play off of and and, and open opportunities off the ball. And obviously another scoring threat, another uh, you know perimeter threat, another uh, player that teams have to go out and, and defend. And obviously it's going to make things easier for for two uh, scorers like like Jalen and Jason. But I, I don't know, man. But I mean, like between between Jalen's post game comments and Jason's. Uh, body language, there's some sort of disconnect. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking these two need to like, just have a sit down, hash it out, and really just on some like grown man shit, you know what I mean? Like, just like, listen, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, and reel the team in and just really dig into these guys. But do either one of you even, can you, either one of you even envision either one of them doing something like that? It's just not their personality, right? It's just not who they are. So what are we talking about here then? Who ha- Someone has to do that. And if it's not them, they have to be at least someone that initiates it or is part of that process because you're the two best players on the team. The team is struggling, it's, you know, under 500. They have mm-hmm. to be the ones to wake this team up, and they have to do it in a way that they've never done it before. Well, that's that's all goes with leadership. I mean, these guys want to be yeah. want to be the leaders, right? I mean, they want you know right. they get the credit when the team's playing well. Um, they got to take the criticism when the team's playing bad, but they can't go up after a loss and no comment the press conference or give you know you know answers that you know totally just disregard the question it, it that's part of being a leadership you might not like it you might not want to deal with the media or deal with you know everything that it comes with being a superstar player but your team's relying on you on the court and off the court to lead them and set the example so that's the one thing that i i actually thought Jalen brown would be a perfect leader because of you know i think he's just a strong strong character and, you know, on and off the court. And I, I, I see a lot of leadership qualities in him, which is why I've been surprised at some of the way he's handled some of the post game um, and some of the way he's, some of the way he's, you know, looked on the court, like, you know, Bobby yeah. mentioned with the defensive side of things. So I am a little surprised to see that. I don't know if they're frustrated with each other, just frustrated with themselves or the situation. I have no reason to believe that they can't play together. I'm not going to go that far. Um, yeah, I, right. I, I don't. I, I think it's like I don't know if they, they just they're having trouble with it, you know, and they just they better just, figure it out because you know right. like, they they are gonna have to play with each other. You know what I mean? Like they're not going anywhere, so they better learn to play with each other. I don't know if they're super close friends. I, I'm not saying they are or they aren't. I don't know. I mean, I'm. I don't, I don't think they are, Jimmy. I mean, I mean, let's I don't face think it. they are either. But I don't I think that hear, matters. I want to hear what you what would you have to say about this, Bobby? Because you know, listen, I mean. Not for nothing, you know, three years together through the ups and downs. These two have been through a lot. And I was a little surprised that Jason Tatum wasn't a little more like, I mean, it's tough. It's after a loss. Obviously, you're not, you know, thinking, okay, I'm going to start this presser by saying, hey, congrats to my teammate Jalen. But I don't know. I just felt like it was sort of like, yeah, you know, he deserves it. Good for him. You know, I was a little surprised there wasn't more, I don't know, at, at first, coming from someone that's been there, you know, first all-star selection. And we talked about it a little bit last episode, but Jason Tatum, to me, he he hasn't been, he's, he was a different person since that day, since he was announced as an all-star to me. And he, he's, he's been that same guy. He's taken that next level in the way he condones and carries himself. But I, I just expect a little, a little more of props for, for Jalen. I don't know. Yeah, it feels like there's some indecision about how to go about this in terms of pulling the team out of this hole. I think we've seen certain games with these guys where they've deferred a little more. 
other ones where they say, all right, this needs to be on all in us because we don't want to frankly have a ton of help here. And then they go all in. I think in particular, this game was one of those situations where they try to go all in and save the day. We saw those situations with Kyrie back in the day. They got frustrating when he lost faith in teammates and, you know, try to take it all on himself. And these guys are more physically capable of doing that than Kyrie was. It was it was tough to watch Kyrie do that, his size and stature, because he's not a guy who's going to plow down people and go to the rim and do those things. Tatum and Brown have been able to do that at certain points throughout the season. Now, when it comes to the press conferences and off the court and stuff like that, they are a little light on the, you know, both positive reinforcement and – the blasting and criticism and call outs that we look for at certain points from your top players. Like it, they're not choosing either one of those directions. It's kind of just more of like a even keeled approach. Like, let's just move on to the next one, see what happens there. Uh, you know, try not to get too emotional. And, and it's not working. Who does that remind you of? <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it kind of stems from, I think the team as a whole does kind of take on the demeanor of the coach. You're right. I mean, now what do you say about that? What do you do off that? I don't know, but it is a fair point. It is a good observation that this team doesn't have a ton of fighter to them. They they really don't, and that's what they, they need right they now. They have no attitude. They have no attitude. Back in the not too long ago, when like guys like Jay Crowder were on the team, not to bring not to be like oh like bring Brad Crowder, but Isaiah Thomas, Jay Crowder, those players, they had a they had like junkyard dog mentality. Like they they knew that people were like undervaluing them or they were the underdogs and they went on there they fought hard and they punched you in the mouth and they didn't win all the time but they had a lot of games where they upset teams and they went deep into the playoffs when everyone think they weren't going to and this team is starting to take the shade of like shape of like uh like a front running a front runner team right a team that just wants you to lay down and, it, and it, like like the like tatum and brown just assume that Oh, it's our team now. Like, and everyone thinks that we're, you know, we're coming up Eastern Conference Finals. Like, here we go. But it's like, no, it's, you need to actually fight for it. You need to have an attitude. You need to punch back. Like, so many times they get punched first and then they just don't punch back. Or a team will punch them halfway through the game and that'll be it. They'll slowly bleed out. Like we saw against Mode, yeah. New Orleans. So I, yeah. I think that's, I think that's a good transition point to talk about, Brad. And that was obviously the topic today. Um, you know, you you got to listen to that whole interview, right, Josue? I did, yeah. I did too. Yeah. So we all heard that earlier from Wick. Basically, the big headline out of it, if you had to pick one, is that Brad's not going anywhere, if you believe him. Um, and every there was some other interesting stuff in there, but the big question everybody's been – Yeah, well, I think we all kind of assumed Ainge was safe and not going anywhere. Um, but Brad's come in the question fairly in the last few weeks – and yes, the very top, the guy who's ultimately going to make this decision is Brad Safe. And I think this is uh, where we can officially decide that he's not going anywhere this season. Now, after the year, we'll see. But there's not going to be a firing over the weekend like John predicted in the group chat. I mean, we're just not going to see that here. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what else did that say to you when it comes to Stevens? Like, was it a ringing endorsement or was it just kind of a, eh, we'll, uh, we'll keep him around? Oh, it's a ringing endorsement. It's it's a message to not only the fans but to the players. Like if you if that even crossed your mind, no, no, figure it out, guys, because he's not going anywhere. And obviously, that's an extreme, right? I mean, I don't think he did it as in like I need to get the message out because Brad is worried. No, I, I think he did it as a uh, more of a maybe a uh, something to motivate the players, something to obviously uh, tame the the fans because it, it's. Have you have either one of you remember where it's reached this point that the, the fan base was calling for Brad to be fired? I mean, we they're saw speaking, a little bit, we saw a little speaking, bit of it last year after the, after the playoffs after they you know were bounced out of the Eastern Conference Finals, but not not to this extent. They're speaking to the fans and media. I mean, there's been that yeah, sense exactly. that there's been that sense that oh, this is a message to the team. I I, I kind of laugh when John brought up the Ainge comments a few weeks ago in the Herald and Gro Globe as if these guys are reading the Herald and Globe. Or listening to ninety eight five, no less. <laughs> like this is this is hey, to I the listen. fans. This is to the this is to the media at large here. People like us, like sending a message to uh, the wider audience here, followers of this team, that Stevens isn't going anywhere, despite the heat, despite the calls for it. And I think that's the right move. Now you're right, Jimmy. Criticism is due. I've always said that uh, the fire, I think, could come from a different place. 
you know, a, a veteran coming in here, an assistant possibly added. You know what the Hawks did this year? That hasn't had a huge impact on them, but has moved their defense a little bit. Is bringing in Nate McMillan as an assistant. And their coach, Lloyd Pierce, has been criticized. I actually said he might be the next to go of all the coaches here in the NBA if this spiral continues in Atlanta and they don't get the playoff picture because McMillan's behind him. And so that's the kind of thing I would look at with the Celtics. And that's another thing you can't really do mid-year. But maybe before this season, I've said, let's bring in a different kind of voice, a different personality here, or at least someone to just compliment Brad and you know bring a different style of leadership in there. I know they kind of try to do that with Evan Turner. We really haven't even heard from Evan Turner all year, have we? Like that was just kind of like a training camp spectacle, and then like it's it's faded away and hasn't had too much of an impact. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what what his role is. I'm I'm sure he's involved to some capacity, but to the point where he's affecting you know player mentality out there, I'm not sure. Listen, I love the idea of bringing in you know former player assistant coaches who work with a certain group of players. I mean, I've been saying that. I said that they should do that for Rob specifically. I was like, get somebody like KG, and I always use that name, but KG, I highly doubt, it, is interested in you know doing that right right now and in his life. But a player that has been there, done that, you know, com- com- competitor uh, that can you know take a player or two under his wing, like basically like what Rondo's doing for Trey Young right now, except Rondo's still good enough to play. Like you kind of need some players like that to give some guidance and some leadership that a coach. As smart as, and as smart as he is and as great of a guy as he is, might not be able to get through to a player because maybe he can't relate on every level, right? I mean, he's let's be honest. You know, Brad Stevens is a great basketball mind, but he, he, you know, I'm sure that there are things that he doesn't comprehend that a player might be able to, you know, understand more, right, from player to player, uh, NBA player to NBA player. Not a knock on Brad, that's just the way it is. But I, I just think that there are things like that that you can point to. So... Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree so with Ryan, you on that but point, Joe Sway, for sure. Joe Sway, Ryan Bernadoni said this, and I always respect his opinion, but I disagree with him occasionally, and this is one where I disagreed with him, where he said, and we went over this a little bit in the group chat, is Stevens really an elite coach? And like he's had the slip-ups over the last few years, the East Finals last year, 2019 certainly, and now there's a major slip on his part. But you earn your reputation – you, you pile up accomplishments over eight years. TNT showed the graphic the other day. He's like the fifth highest tenured coach in the league. And that's just not – that's not because Ainge has been sitting around or unwilling to make a move on him or he's just had this, you know, unearned seniority here that hasn't been challenged just because of complacency. I mean, he has earned all this uh, time that he's gotten as coach here and all the achievements that they piled up. And I know – you laugh at East Finals because it's the Celtics, but that's that was a mark of consistency, and it was a mark in some years of overachieving, 2017 and 18 particularly. Yeah, no question. And when you look at his personnel, you can't rest on your laurels, boys. Well, we talked about it last. Yeah, but week. you don't get fired for one year. I guess you can say two years if you loop this in with 19 compared the, to the bigger picture. It's the what, combination the tw- of the personnel, like so many different personalities, and the, the results were almost identical right throughout those years throughout that span and yeah of course 2017 you can say to a certain extent they they overachieved but to be the one the last team standing before you know LeBron had to go ahead and go to the NBA finals that we you know everyone knew that was going to be the next step but to be in his way that many times I think speaks volumes for for the kind of coach that Brad is and and for what he's able to do I I still think he's in the top tier I, I don't think anyone or most people wouldn't refute that I just think this whole, oh, he's the next Popovich, the whole, I think, and that that wasn't, you know, a lot of people were, were feeling that way, that it was sort of just given to him and that it was a little too, pre, it was premature that he hadn't reached the NBA finals yet. So I, I think, I think it's a combination of people who, who went from, you know, calling him the top two, top three best coach in the NBA, who were saying, all right, maybe he's top five, top six. And some people was calling that light little fall they're thinking it's way more, you know, like he slipped all the way down the bottom. I don't think that's the case. Well, so listening to Wick today, I wasn't surprised at all. I, I think I even said yesterday, Wick, Wick's, you know, when it comes to like loyalty, he's a pretty loyal owner, right? I mean, he's he stick sticks by, you know, whether it's the front office, whether it's coaches. Um, How hot did it get with Doc there in those years? Because I wasn't covering them back then. Like, was it this it, level? It, it, yes. Bobby, they had the prior to the trade, they had the worst season like you could ever imagine. I mean, it was fire Doc every single day at the <laughs> arena, on the airwaves. 
And Wick Grosbeck literally said, I'm not, you know, we're sticking with Doc. We believe in Doc. We, we, we love Doc, and we want him to continue to coach this team. If he's not going to fire Doc during that season, they had no idea that they were going to trade for Kevin Garnett. Yeah, but and that Ray was, Allen and flip I it feel like that like was that. After, after Rondo went down, though, right, Jimmy? Like, up until that point, they weren't. There were a few games above 500, but they weren't. They weren't like this, right? Pierce, Pierce, no, Pierce, Pierce was, you know, pretty much done. Like, yeah, that I know that was that thing though, because Rondo was was almost carrying those guys. So when Rondo went down, it was like, wow. But then, you know, Pierce well, went the, into the, point guard Pierce for like a, a couple of weeks, and they were they were holding themselves up a bit. It seemed like they're right. gonna be all right, and then they just pulled the, the last. 10, 15 games, they went complete 500. And, oh, they yeah. sucked. That was an awful year. I'm telling you. Yeah. I so went what's, that, what's that tell us about now? Like, is it, there anything it there? That, you... it, it just tells me that Wick's, Wick respects, you know, he respects Brad way too much to fire him during the season. Just like he respected Doc's, Doc way too much to consider firing him. Um, and Doc was, at that point, way less credentialed as a head coach. He, you know, yeah. he was fired at, in, in um, Orlando. And there really wasn't a, other than him being a really great guy and players liked him. Um, there wasn't a whole lot to hang your hat on. I think he had a, actually, I think he had a, a oh, good season or so prior. Oh, the 06, 07 season? I thought you were talking about the last year of, P of Pearson Garnett. No, no, but no. this was before, yeah. 06, 07. Oh, oh, yeah, dude, this is way worse. I mean, that was way worse, yeah. Yeah, well, that's how bad it was. But, like, even oh, yeah. then, like, Wick was like, I'm going to stick by my guy. Like, he's not getting yeah, fired. Gotcha. So, of course, okay. he's going to say that about Brown. I'm not surprised. Like, I, I, and I agree, like. You don't fire a coach in this situation. You don't fire a coach. It has to be an extreme circumstance for you to fire a coach midseason. And this isn't that. And I don't even know if they're, they'll consider it in the offseason because, like Wick said, he knows that if, if, if Brad or Ainge win, they would be, you know, an extremely hot commodity. <laughs> wouldn't, it, wouldn't it be something for Brad? I'll, I'll say what? this, though. That's not a reason to keep a guy just because you know somebody else will take him. That's not a reason to. But he's making the point that, you know, there's still a lot to – like about having Ainge and Brad on your side. He's not willing to put that in jeopardy right now. So we'll yeah. see. There's a lot of basketball to play. So, I mean, a, yeah. a lot of that can change. Well, Wick is Wick and, and it, it's, it's interesting because before they, when they started their pursuit for the next head coach, uh, Danny Ainge asked all the owners to list three head coaches, any head coaches that they would want to coach the Celtics. And every single owner had a Brad Stevens slot. Like so, I, I think that it just speaks volumes for obviously. I don't know if how they big, would today, though. <laughs> I think that speaks volumes. I know, right? I think that speaks volumes to how high they obviously how high they were before they hired him, and I don't think that's gone down between now and then, right? Like, if anything, it's gone up, or at least it stayed the same. Wait, who? You know, how Brad. they feel about Brad? You know, the owners. Well, how who feels? How the owners feel about Brad? You mean the Celtics owners? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought you meant around the league. No, no, no. I mean, like the sub, the ones that everyone that had a Brad Stevens slot because they all wanted out of the three head coaches that they wanted to coach to take over Doc, Brad was on that list for every single one, every owner's list. And I just think between now and then, like what's really what's outside of the Kyrie season and what we're seeing within the last couple of months, when has this team had a reason to be really disappointed in Brad? So a buddy of mine, my, my buddy Matt, he, he we're in a group text and he texted son, he said, he said, I think Brad Stevens is a floor raiser, but I don't think he's a ceiling raiser. And I was like, you mm. know what? I kind of like that. Like, that like kind of makes a lot of yeah. sense to me. Like, he can, he's like, yeah. <laughs> I like like, and I was like, damn, my buddy Matt Keith, if you watch, I don't know if he is. But, <laughs> but um, okay, it kind of makes sense to me because, like, we've seen Brad raise, raise, a lot of, raise the floors up to a lot of overachieving Celtics teams. But when it comes to going from where you – should be going or where you are to where you should be going it almost seems like there is a you know th there's a limit right i mean there, you know a player players or players are leaving you know what i mean like stars are leaving um you've got some what it looks like i'm not going to say disgruntled stars here because they're not that but they're obviously something's up so i don't know if there is a ceiling that we're trying to get past here that we just haven't been able to um, you know that that's a knock. I think if you if you're looking for one so far, I think that you could that you could probably put put on Brad if you're trying to. Yeah. Uh, I don't yeah, know. I mean, he's that's... he's always gonna feel the weight of what happened in 2019 because he did deserve some criticism in that and wasn't able to help that team get to its potential. So that was that, a... was, yeah. that was a shortcoming. This team, and he said this before the season, 
and has repeated it throughout, maybe to preemptively prepare people for what was going to happen here. So this was going to be a massive challenge. The roster, the season, the way it's set up, they're not the only team underperforming around. I've mentioned the Heat and the Raptors who have had to overcome some awful starts here. And this whole Kemba situation that they've had it gone through, which has not been easy by any means. I mean, there was a lot that they were going to have to trudge through here. This was almost the opposite in many ways of 19. Like expectations were through the roof that year. This year, once Kemba went down, it was like, oh, Jesus, this team isn't going to make the playoffs. And I remember I said, if they make it through that Kemba will stretch at 500, I'd be impressed. And they made it through above at that point. And then the integration point has been the tough part there. So I still look at this and say, this team needs to give Brad the chance with a quality roster, a roster so that can win it all. Like he needs to get that opportunity. And that's why I look at the GM, I look at the ownership here, and I look at Jimmy, who doesn't want to add aggressively, and I say, you got to yeah. go do it. you got to give him a chance. Because well, if, this spirals, don't. Don't you know, if this keeps spiraling, Stevens is going to lose his job. Like it, it, this, not... this is just going to get lower and lower and lower at this point with the faith that's been lost at the top-level players. I mean, you mentioned it the other day. Was Brown calling out Stevens after one of the more recent games? He was he was saying, like, you know, when's the team going to do what it needs to do here? Like, mm -hmm. get some help, that kind of thing. Bobby, it, you keep going back to that point. I don't know. And w somebody lied to you when they said that your job as a GM is to make sure it's as fair as it can be for the head coach. That's not the GM's job. The GM's job is to put the team in the best position to win, whether that's today, tomorrow, next day or the next season you're going to make the best decision well, those are bill kind Belich of the same thing bill belichick says it all the time we do what we think is best for the team not what's best for brad stevens it might be unfair that brad stevens yeah. didn't get um you know a mega star at the trade deadline but guess what join the crowd of every other nba coach who won't get a team who won't get a player like that he has the team that he has and it's on him to coach them up we can all agree that they're underperforming right now so you have to put some blame on brad you don't just say oh brad you need another player now okay Let's let's drain the rest of the assets that we have and all our picks and any player that maybe might amount to something someday so that we can be fair to you um, so you don't get fired. That's just not how it works. You hold on to those assets. You hold on to the PPE until you're ready to make what you think is the best possible trade to improve your team. And if Brad's still the coach at that time, great. No one's saying oh, he's going to get fired man. at the end of the season anyways. Right? If. It's like that, Jimmy. It's an if now. You're not if, buying I'm saying whenever that day comes. When I'm, oh, okay. if, if, if it is, great. But you're not doing it for Brad. You're doing it for the team. You're doing it because right. you want to win games. Well, not like, because you want to be fair to Brad. Last, it's like what I was talking about last night. It's like all, all of the Celtics fans are like, fire Brad, fire Brad. Okay, well, you tell me who you have to replace it. Because if you don't have anyone, then what's the logic behind that? Like, how is it's that? It's not our job. It's not our job to have a list of replacements. Who had Brad Stevens as the Celtics replacement when when Job Rivers went to the Clippers? Who in this room had Brad? Nobody. No, Nobody that's in the true, chat had Brad Stevens. Honestly, that was it's not our job. It's not our job to say season, here's though. who you need to replace Brad with. And we're not saying replace Brad. All we're saying is there are issues here, and nobody is on a pedestal high enough. Do you think? Do you think Grossbeck was being truthful? Fired. Jimmy. Yes, I do think he was being truthful. Well, I mean, what did he really say? He's not gonna that he believes in Brad and he believes in the and he believes in Danny. Of course he does. I think he does. Yeah. Well, but that I mean, doesn't mean that that's gonna change. That, that oh, yeah, things yeah. change. That's my point. It, that's my information point. changes. I mean, the season plays itself out, and they and they suck. Then they have no choice but to make some changes. They might still stick with Brad. They might truly want to stick with Brad and and stick with Ange, and they'll have to make some serious player moves. Obviously, a change will have to come. But I believe Wick when he goes on and says that he that he believes in Brad and he believes in Ancient. I believe him when he believe, says that he believes in Brown and Tatum. I mean, did that sound like a guy who wanted to even consider the notion of, you know, Brown or Tatum being unhappy and potentially wanting to go somewhere else? He shot that down very quickly when I think it was Maz may have, you know, may, may have mentioned something along the lines. He was like, the, the ink is still wet on their contract. So yeah, he's not even considering a team that doesn't have Tatum and Brown. So yeah, I, I I believe, I believe what he said. I mean, I don't think anything he said was like groundbreaking either. I think he went and he said what a lot of what we probably expected him to say. The team's not a contender. He believes in the co in the front office and the coaching staff, and he expects the players to play better. Whether or not they do, we'll find out. And then they'll make decisions did from did, there. But did anything surprise you, Josue? No. In the interview. I had one thing. 
So this this is loosely this is loosely related to Jimmy's point, and I actually backed up Jimmy's point that maybe they won't use that TP this year in a significant way. Uh, they asked him the, about expectations for that uh, TP, and he started mentioning the hard cap and the restrictions that are on them. And the way he mentioned the hard cap was kind of kind of deceptive. Like, there's not just this hard cap on them that like says they yeah. can't do anything here. You can send out some money and use that as a way to pick up someone for the full TPE here. Like, yes, you can't go over, I think the number is 20 million, but if you send out 8 million, you can get to 28 million. So that was kind of deceptive, but he, I think he essentially set up expectations for that TPE as um, maybe a piece of it is used now, but the brunt of it probably expect the off season, which to me goes back to that point that the help may not be coming here. And that worries me significantly like that because this is just going to keep yeah, sliding we could, tell, we could tell you want that you want the big fish yeah and, and, okay, worried, and I, I don't know what you think could happen i don't know what you think is possible or why you're so dead set on like this push to the nba finals like what about this team tells you that they're even one player away right now no, so Bobby I think to, uh, Bobby's waiting for an all-star uh, Julius Randle to, to trade at this. <laughs> right. it's like, I have not mentioned that name. This no, isn't a one-year window. This isn't a one-year window. Like, what? Yeah. like what, what Wick, Wick even basically said, like these guys, the ink on these guys' contracts are still wet. If you're building a team around Brown and Tatum, why are you acting like this is a one-year window and they need to go all in this year? They don't. And yeah. if they do, they've totally handcuffed themselves to do anything of – real value in the summer or going forward if you have nothing left congrats you have no assets and no draft picks left and you have these four contracts you better hope that they can all work together and win that's right. a championship because well, that, that's the only that's way right, that it'll it's, make it work that's uh that's how we're going to wrap this one up there you can sleep on that right <laughs> we got we got miles turner in the uh in the pacers on friday it just doesn't get easier for these guys right bobby miles ooh, ooh, bobby. i wish john was here for that game any pay just before we uh, before we wrap up, well, Miles Turner has proved himself in some type of way this year, and it's a tough situation to go over again at this point. We'll probably talk about it a little bit on Friday, yeah, but well there's so, there's so many different like versions of that. And Wick also mentioned that deal. I think he was very vague about it too, but he said the price was too expensive, but it was also something that was never going to happen. Uh, so I didn't know like which were they engaged fully there, and the price was too expensive, or was it never going to happen because Hayward was going to Charlotte no matter what? Like those are the two sides of the story that are out there, and he kind of threw both of those out there on that one. So I think that situation is just way too hard to read at this point, uh, to the point where I think we just kind of need to assume that there was no way to acquire Turner because of the fact that Hayward wasn't going there, which is basically just going with what happened, you know, in the end. Like no, but, nothing but, gonna... but everyone told me that's that they didn't. What was that, Joe? I said that's not fun. Just that's just not fun at all. Pretend like that Miles Turner thing wasn't on the table. No, I don't well, like. Everyone told me that they didn't want Miles Turner, including Bobby. No, I why guess would they I... want? Why yeah, would they was... want Miles Turner in that? The, untreatable... the room was split. The room was split, Jimmy. If I'm not mistaken. It was split. Where, where were yeah. you on it? I was on your side. I like. I, yeah. I would love Miles Turner on this team. Uh, I think it was three to one. I don't think it was split. Oh, I think of it course. Was, <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't give it was just, it. You're right. Yeah, it, it was, was just Bobby good. on an island as usual. But it was all this stuff about Turner. He's a uh, liability. He can't shoot. He has an untradeable contract. I use. I heard that one a million times. He has an untradeable contract. You know why? You know why? I don't know. You want to know why he has an untradeable contract? Because if you're the Celtics, you probably can't trade for him. That's the only untradeable contract. I, I want to hear when it comes to Miles Turner and the Boston Celtics right now. And if All they right. had gotten him, if they had gotten him, and again, it may not have been an option, but if they had gotten him, I am willing to bet the Celtics are slightly better off than they are right now. Only yeah. other, uh, only other point. I know you want to wrap it just way that I got out of that one. Um, Paul made a, on Friday. They made a yeah. giant offer to Hayward, which is something we had heard before, uh, but he he made it very clear that. They were all in on keeping Hayward. They were all in on keeping Irving, Horford, and others. Like, all those guys, they weren't moving on from any of them. And I think Hayward in particular was a guy they needed to keep around here. But okay. they didn't see – I don't think from the stuff I've heard, they didn't go to that, like, 120 range there. So I, I 
if it was a hundred million, I mean, I think you can consider that a giant offer. Like a hundred million is a huge offer, but it wasn't an offer that would have retained Hayward. Right. You know. Right. That that's yeah, like you would you would have been surprised if he got paid more than Jalen. Is that what you're pretty much saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be that honest, right? Up, I mean, yeah, that would have been shocking. So it ended up. That's what it ended up costing, and everyone bashed Hayward for doing it. But guess what? He's thriving in Charlotte, and the Hornets are a pretty damn fun team to watch right now. I don't know if people have been watching them, but watch out for the Hornets because they can give a team like the Celtics a run for their money the way they're playing. Not to say any other team in the NBA couldn't right now either, but well, yeah, yeah, we yeah. have to wait. Is it just me, or he has like a the surprising like like checklist of injuries that he's just going down the list this season? Like, <laughs> Was it the hand or the finger to start? And then it was like the well, that's shin. Natural, yeah. like, that, you got to pencil those in, three or four of those in a year. Obviously. I think it was his ear, the last one. He missed a game because it was his ear. I, don't know. I can't. I can't <laughs> keep up. Gordon. Uh, he is missed. He, this he is he's balling, though. I, I, I give him that. He's balling. This chat right. was so excited to see him go. I just And I say the same thing about Stevens. Be careful what you wish for here. He'll be in Charlotte next thriving, right? <laughs> Yeah, that might happen. Uh, <laughs> yeah, save the tape. The 2020, no, the 2022 or 2023, 24 Hornets, one of those. I know. said one of those will be champs <laughs> with all the former Celtics. They'll pick up Horford, too, to play center. I, I, can see, I can literally, I just pictured Jordan and Brad Stevens lighting a stogie together. <laughs> wow. It's going to wow. be like Brady and the Buccaneers. <laughs> This night, this night, this night's gonna get weird. We're on that note. We're out of here, guys. We appreciate you <laughs> that with us. Uh, we hope we yeah. made you feel a little bit better, you know, compared to now. Uh, what was it, an hour ago or so when we first started? Maybe four maybe. games off yeah, to the roughly. break. Just get I don't know through. if we can make Survive. it too much, too much better, but but we're all suffering together. If that maybe that's comfort. Mis misery loves company, right? Right, exactly. And you know what? There you this, go. For, for a game like this, this is really good numbers, guys. So we appreciate you guys uh, uh, staying with us, staying up with us. Uh, of course, you already hey, know, CLNS Media, all your continuous coverage, Celtics coverage on YouTube at CLNS Media. Hey. Of course, of course, on Twitter at CLNS, Celtics CLNS. Uh, of course, nothing but up-to-date uh, info, information, of course, on the Celtics. And Friday night, Bobby, I think we get Boomer Nick, if I'm not mistaken. Right, Boomer rage in the building. Yeah, that's yeah, the hot rumor. Really this rumor. would have been a good night for him, but if if it keeps on the same trajectory, Friday could be even worse. So it might actually end up looking like uh, we saved them for the right one there. I don't know. I'm concerned for his health. I'm I'm actually glad he missed this one. Uh, you know, a guy like with that kind of rage. At the Garden, can we get the? Uh, can we get Gino? Maybe. This team is so unpredictable. I wouldn't be shocked to turn around and, and and beat the Pacers by twenty on Friday. This I is the be. first time we've mentioned Gino on the show this year. What does that say? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Cue yeah. the music. Cue um, the music. Marigold Medical. We want to give them a shout out before we get out of here. Joe Sway, you're more, you're a little more up on them than I yeah, am. But Marigold Medical for uh, for our for our listeners, we appreciate you, of course, and we already know we're trying to take care of you. All right, chronic pain, you want to get it taken care of. Uh, you want to get what uh, Kemba Walker was helped him, you know, go out there and be healthy. Don't have to talk about the stats, but you know he's out there. He's healthy. He's, he's not he's free, and uh, you could be in a similar path if you for with the, with a free console. Of course, there's the phone number there. Uh, check out the website or call either one. You could do it virtual, or you can uh, go in there, masked up, and whichever whichever you feel most comfortable. Of course. And tell them Cedric Maxwell sent you. Tell them Cedric yeah. sent you. Tell them Max sent you, of course. And uh, check out a new episode of Cedric Maxwell podcast as well. And of course, all the. Uh, other great podcasts we have, NBA Celtics podcast that we have on CLNS Media, guys. It's going to do it for us. I am Joseph Pavone, for Bobby Manning, Jimmy Toscano. We'll see you guys next time. Uh, we'll see what Celtics team shows up, I guess, next time, right? Ooh, I can't see if, see if anybody shows up. Let's just we'll see, see if they actually show shows up. up. And what the narrative is going to be, because I have no idea at this point. Friday is too far away from now, so we'll have to wait and see. <laughs>